Uh, anyway, today we have Reed Wade. He's presenting to us on Bottle and U Whiskey, simple web app configuration and fun hidden features, also known as the title up there. So a bit about Reed. He's from Tennessee, but he's been in New Zealand for seven years. Whether or not he considers himself a Kiwi yet, we're not sure. Neither is he. He used to work at Catalyst, and he started Python about 15 years ago when the company he worked for was accidentally bought by WebMD. If you want to know more about how that works, you'll have to talk to Reed. Please welcome Reed. Well, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. This is uh, this is not really a talk about how to use these things. It's more the fact that you can, right? So um, I know a lot of people say I'm not an expert. I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm one of those people, right? So. Um, getting into it. What I'll do is show you how to make a web API um, and then a web API with a little bit of app on it and then later um, a little bit about how to use UISGI in strange ways that I discovered by accident and then ways that you can take this home and maybe do it like I know Jay wants to hopefully. Um, this is if you were at the Basil talk earlier this is more complicated than that. <coughs> Right, so if this is if you, if you don't want the nice vagrant um, pleasant way to do it, this is this is a way to do a little bit less, but with about the same level of complexity. Um, this is the stack that I normally use. It's one I like. It fits the kind of problems that I like to solve, and it works great for the little problems that I have to solve. And I think it may work for for other things as well. Um, Bottle is a nice, light little framework. It's, um, if you've heard of Flask, it's a little bit less than Flask. If you've heard of Django, it's a lot less than Django. The fun thing about it is it's very tiny. It's very, you can hold it in your hand. It's about 3,000 lines of code, and you can carry it with you where you go. And it only does just, it does exactly what I care about. UISGI is the thing that you need in order to make stuff work. Normally, you, you don't want it, you don't care about it. It's a thing that you need in order for your thing to work, right? It's this, it's this thing. Nginx is, this, is my favorite web, um, web server. Um, it's Apache has been great, but it's never been fun to configure. The more stuff you can do with Apache, the less fun it is to configure. Mm -hmm. Nginx is the thing to use now. AngularJS makes your JavaScript go away, is my take on it, which is nice. Um, and then, um, what I think about a lot, and what I'll probably mention a lot during this talk, is the distinction between your creative inputs and then all the stuff that you have to do in order to be happy, right? And so, in general, the blue things will be what I'll be pointing at. Um, and a big reason for this talk has been to let you know what these other things are that have been kind of pain if you don't already know how to use them. This is another way to look at the previous slide. So it's not really accurate, but it's helpful to think about things. So the stuff on the left is, is the data flow for your, for your web app. The things on the right is your, your actual web app itself. Um, and we're going through the stacks here. Oh, and that's, that's my kitty. Um, she, yeah. And she's relevant because uh, I haven't really talked about this as much, but I always approach web applications in this way. There's, there's going to be a web API, and that's the thing that's going to outlast the markup. It, it's when you change the colors on the website or you decide, oh, I don't want to use Angular anymore, that's not cool, or Bootstrap, that's, you know, now that, now that I'm getting into Bootstrap, apparently that's not the thing anymore. But I expect the Web API to out, outlive all of us if it's done correctly. Um, robots, and also if you've got other applications that are using it, they don't care about the markup. Robots like Web APIs. Cats don't like Web APIs. They do like JavaScript and, and nice pretty things. And when you're designing your application, it's really valuable to consider both of those customers. Um, and so straight into it. So, this is why I like about like bottle is it's 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 really tiny. Oh, I lost a bit. Where's your place for it? 
that better? Um, is that better? Okay. But if I do like this, is it worse? Okay. Um, I even borrowed another thing from McKitty, which is this. Um, so fun, fun facts about Model. Um, it's one line import, like I said, it's 3,000 lines. There is a Debian package for python bottle. You can use it. I have had trouble using it when the version of Model that you think you're using is different from the one you're using. And sometimes you want the more recent version. Occasionally there's a, there's a bug you care about. In general, though, don't sweat it. Um, uh, Bottle.route is a decorator that says, you know, that URL, call this, call, call this function. Right? And the results of the function get sent to the client. So in, about, in just a couple of lines, you've got, I mean, you're done, right? This is your web app. Um, another fun feature is if you return, oh, down here, if you return a dict, it converts that to JSON for you because that would be a nice thing for it to do, and it does it. Um, and then for testing, you can, you can just, just run that, and it'll, it'll start a little, little web server for you, and you can just hit it and then start doing things right away. So right here could be, I mean, we could go home, but there's more. Um, so this is... Once you start getting into it, it's not really as fun. Um, this part's still fun, right? Um, you run into real-time constraints. You, if you're using the, the, the one-liner thing, which sometimes you'll, you'll use that and it works, so you don't need to change it. There's no reason to go to any effort. But it's single-threaded, and so if you've got something that's going off and doing something, and you've got more than one person on the planet hitting your application, it's going gonna, it's gonna to block. Um, also, it's, it's, you know, you run into real life problems. That's just what's going to happen. Um, so you, you say, okay, I've got a, I've, I need more stuff. I need uh, like a web server and some things. First you discover you need UWSGI and it's, you don't know why you need it, right? You need, it's this thing, if you, I, I need to run this thing on our web server, so I have to, I need this thing. Um, and so you get it working. Um, sometimes you get it working. Usually it's, it's pretty straightforward. You have to do at least this. So this is the config file for, this is a basic minimal config file. Um, oh crap, there's something missing. This, I think this is an old version of the slide, sorry. But, um, oh we may have a slide emergency. Let me just check one thing. Don't look, look that other way real quick. Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to get a different copy of these slides. There's like hugely important stuff missing here. Um, though they might be on this thing. Uh, I think I may have even copied the right one here. Can I reposition your mic? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, cheers. Um, they're on this machine. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Um, what I'm going to do is just steal, <laughs> steal this. Are, you, are we okay to unplug this and plug it into that? I'm just going to swap this out. Could, it, could anything go wrong? Because the fun thing about this set of slides is I've got lots of error messages in them. 
and I discover that error message. So, and, and they're even inspired by the problem on this slide. Um, Friday night, I thought it would be fun to test the things I was telling you about and discovered that nothing worked at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, not even a little bit. It was really slick. So, um, I'm going to come back to this slide, but what my, my real point about this, uh, what I wanted to do is show you the... Um, Here's what you need, and that's, that's all you need. Um, and going through it really quickly, the line of the, uh, uh, the socket line is defining the connection that UISGI is going to make available for the web server to interact with it so that then your, your service can run. It looks like you should be able to type that in a web browser. And if you're just kind of playing around and you're just, you're just looking at the docs, you think, oh, that's probably a URL. I can hit that. And you try it out and you get some weird thing. Anyway, that's not a proper URL. Often, I'll say, is the socket could be a Unix domain um, path, which like it looks, something looks like a file. Um, and that's kind of the preferred way, depending on what you prefer. I like this because you don't have to worry about file permissions. But you do have to worry about port assignments. So it's, it's depending on what, what day, you know, what, what, uh, what you like to worry about more. I, I like to worry about port numbers, but I think that's the wrong path to take. It's just what I do. Um, the next two lines just say that's where my code is. Um, so the bottle app we had before, that's the, if you call it example, because that's a nice name. The rest of it is just, yeah, just, just do these things. Right? You can kind of guess what they do. Master, I never can remember what that does. I think uh, somebody will know. <laughs> Plugins is, is going to come, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's, it turns out to be important. UISGI is for serving Python apps mostly, but you have to be explicit about the fact that you really are serving up Python apps, cause, and so you tell it to use the Python plugin. And if you don't, it says, oh, I don't know, you, you, you're crazy. Um, and sometimes you want the, to change the user and group ID. Workers is the number of threads it's going to start up, number of processes concurrent, which turns out to be really nice. Um, so um, Nginx already said about that, it's just use it. It's, uh, it's very easy to configure. One nice thing about it I like is that you can use it for small things, and it's easy to set up and configure for small things, but then if you need to scale to like a billion users, you, can, you don't have to switch what you're doing. It's, you just need more of them. Um, and here's the, your Nginx config, and normally they get a little more complicated than this. Um, as I was putting this together, I noticed a change in the way that these are constructed compared to a few years ago. Used to be, you would configure your web server to um, serve your application. And now this is just for serving files. It's providing a gateway to your application. And so the way you construct the, the paths, so what, what, what this says is, any URL, just pat, uh, give me file. If it starts with slash API, hand it to the API backend. In the past, we would have written that the, the other way around. That here's your, here, here's your uh, I don't know, maybe I'm making too big a thing of that. But it, it struck me as, as now that we're letting the, the browser do the work. It's just, it's just different. Um, but this is, this is simple. Um, one of the things, if you look at the default Nginx config that's bundled, there's lots and lots of options. It, it wants to show you all the things you can do. And it can be a little intimidating. Um, but you can just delete all that and start from scratch and, and, and uh, get productive pretty quickly. And here's all the things you need to install. If you're running a Debian style machine, that just works. Um, I mentioned before about UISGI thinks that even though it's only used for Python, that it thinks Python special, so that's a separate module you need to, to involve. Um, and here's, here's the four files. I didn't mention what's in the uh, HTML file because it doesn't matter. It can be nothing or anything. And now you're done, right? Here you have a fully formed, all the things you need to do to make a nice little web app. Um, but you want it to be, you want to use Angular because Angular is cool. And you want to do more things than, than just have a little API. Um, one reason I wanted to use this laptop is because it was on the net. But um, the example application we've got here is you type something in the hole, 
and it goes, hits a web service that calculates the MD5 and returns that. Also, because we're using Angular, um, the thing you type here is going to show up here. If you've looked at Angular at all, if you see any, any of the tutorials and demonstrations, they always do that because it's really cool. And like if you, as you're typing, um, this changes here. And it's not too hard to do that using jQuery and JavaScript. And you would never do it in real, like, like that's insane, right? There's no reason to do that. But <laughs> what it does is it demonstrates, um, I'll go ahead and get right to it. Well, okay, I'll come back to what this demonstrates. What it demonstrates is that Angular is really clever. And it, it tidies up a lot of the noise that you used to have to deal with with JavaScript. So in your markup, you can say curly brace, um, name of the variable, and then whenever it changes, anywhere in your application, it changes on the page. And you don't have to be explicit about it, it just does it. Um, and, that's, and, that's, and, so, and so people demonstrate the fact that you can do that so easily. Um, here's the application, or here's, here's what I think of as the application because I, I, I write Python. I don't write markup, I don't write JavaScript, except during the day. Um, this is where my, my, this is where I enjoy myself. And so, yeah, so it's, it's smaller than the other example. There is a difference which is worth noting. Um, before I said bottle.route, and up here I'm saying app dot app equal application equal, app, you know, all this, all this noise here. This is the start of having to play with other things. The, when UISGI runs um, or imports your, your code, it's going to look for a variable called app or application, depending on what version you might be using. So the normal thing to do is have a line like that, and then, and then instead of calling bottle, you call app dot whatever. If you, if you skip and just say bottle.route, it, it, will, it will implicitly create one of these objects for you and do the right thing. But normally, you, you, you kind of instantly have to do that. And then your, your stuff down here has to change. You have to pass in the, the application object. Um, and this is, this is the Angular side of things. And this is, this is kind of the, the fun bit I was, I, was, I was hopefully explaining earlier. Um, so down here, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the whole page. Um, that you've got things that start ng something are angular something. And they use the idea of a model uh, which defines the, the name of your variable. And so you see i down here, which is bound to this input. And this is i, this, that's the same i there. And then up here, it's, it's, it's passed into scope, it's so scope.i. Um, so what's happening here is you've got your input here, you make changes, you type, and so this gets called. <coughs> So every time you type something, this gets called, and then there's your your function, your your API call happens, and then a result eventually shows up. That gets set to result, which is this guy here, and magic. Right. Um, this used to be harder to do, even for small things like this. Um, and I guess this this kind of gets back to what what my point was. I want to demonstrate that really this is pretty straightforward. Um, you can find better uses for this technology, I hope. <laughs> Though sometimes, I mean, I've, every now and then you need exactly this. Um, and so now, you know, this was, that you're done, right? At this point, I had had to dig around into the UISGI documentation. Um, there's, uh, there probably, I don't know, there's them, some guys I work with, I was helping out, um, get working with UISGI. And they were trying to do some things it turns out it's not possible to do. But I dug into the documentation enough that I discovered that it actually, it's not just this thing that's in the way that you have to kind of accommodate. It will help you out. And before, um, before coming to New Zealand, I was doing a lot of Java. And the one thing I really do miss about Java is the whole J2E application server where you, you, your web application it has this nice big shared environment. You can you can you can pass memory around very easily and very safely. Um, that's my memory of it. That's the only thing I remember of it. But this reminded me a lot of that. So suddenly now in your your little Python apps that are that are running around in in the server can they can pass memory around. They can do things, and that was exciting to me. So I started playing around and trying to figure out what use this could be. And another, another warning I would say is that I didn't find a good use for this talk. But 
and I'm not making this up, we did find a use for it at work. So it's, it's, I feel a little bit better, even though the examples are kind of, oh yeah, sorry. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about specifics here. So mules, that's a thing. Um, shared memory signals, yay. Um, a worker, a U whiskey worker is a thing that takes a client request and does something with it. A mule is a process that doesn't. It's just running, which doesn't sound useful unless you can interact with it in some way, and that way is signals. So anyway, you, you, in, your, in your configuration, you say how many workers, you can also say mules, how many, how many mules you want, and those are just separate process threads. Caches um, are these shared data structures. You have to configure them in the UISGI config file. You have to read the documentation to understand what, how you should configure it. Uh, you have to declare the size of them. They're a little bit limited. Um, but you've got, I, I, my belief is they are written to provide, like, <coughs> like the current one is called cache two. I presume there was a cache without the two. Um, my belief is they were originally um, written to provide the kind of things you would need in a web app, like you want to cache portions of a page you know, in the web server. That's very convenient to be able to do. Um, queues, the way they're named, makes me think that they were for, for managing work and processes and things to, to do some task. But um, really, cache is just a key value store, and a queue is an array. And these are the functions that you can use. These are when you, another thing that I didn't really um, show is that in your, in your bottle app, you can suddenly now, if you're running under uWSGI, you can say import uWSGI, and these things are available to you. There's a, there's a whole collection of, uh, there's a uWSGI module that gives you things like this. So once you've defined the cache, you're running, your mules or workers can make these calls. And then the queue, it's very similar, just more of a, more of a, more of a stack, um, stack slash array type of type of uh, interface. Signals are almost what you want. They're, they're they're a little bit dissatisfying because you can signal a process, but you can't tell it anything. So there's no there's not a mechanism for giving it client data. So what you can do is you can broadcast a signal, which is a, a one byte value, and it's not really <coughs> even that useful because the whoever's receiving it needs to know what signal you're going to send it. So they already have to be accept, ex, expecting that one by value. But it's a nice way to wake things up. Um, and they can be broadcast to all workers, all mules, a single one, or the most useful one is, is the one at the bottom, which is send this message to a mule or worker that's not already busy doing something else. Um, and these, this is the interfaces. Um, if you want to receive a signal, you register, you've created, um, you have a method. And you register that method, and you say what signal number you're going um, to receive. And this is um, a little bit sort of feels a little inside out to me, but this is more. This feels like it should go down here. It's it's sort of it's saying when when that signal fires, run this function on an available mule. So the 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 guy in the middle there, mule could be mules which means all of them, or workers, which means all of them, or worker two, which sends it to the worker two. Um, but it, it, this feels a little, little 1990s to me. Um, I think if this was used a lot more, it would be nicer. And in fact, there are some things uh, that are a little bit nicer that I haven't really talked about. There's a notion of a programmed mule. I think I had uh, a mention of it on a previous slide. A programmed mule runs in a separate, runs different code. And so it's not, it's not a, just another instance of your, of your existing application. It's, 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 it, and it's a little more of a pain to set up. I haven't messed with it. But that, you can get actually give it information. Um, and then here's your trigger. So you can have a trigger. So every 60 seconds, fire signal 11, which means this happens and some mule will do this thing. Right? Um, in your code somewhere, you can just explicitly trigger signal 11 or signal 111. And the other fun thing is if this file changes, that signal gets fired. Fun things. Uh, oh, yeah, OK, there's, this is the start of the apologies. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say it. So imagine you needed a, a web page that had three buttons. And one button 
would say, I would like a cake. And another button says, I would like a pie. And another button says, what's going on? What, what's being made right now? OK? Right? Because that's what you need. Um, and this is a screenshot of one of those. Um, what happens is, well, I'll show you the code. And, and it'll either make sense or not. So that's the web page. You've got three buttons up there. If you click that, then you get an order number up here, here. And a worker is going to ask a mule to start doing something. It's going to say, make a pie or make a cake. But it's not doing that exactly. What it's going to do is going to put that in a data structure somewhere and then send a signal that says there's something new that you should go look at. Um, and in response, it gets that tracking number, which is just this, this little guy here, which so we can prove that something ha is happening later. And then um, if, you, if you hit the check inventory button, this causes this section to update here, which it gets the, it basically gets the, all the, the, the entire data set and displays it in, in an inefficient way. But it demonstrates, it gives you evidence that something's happening, which is exciting, and that there's different things doing it. This is, uh, we're now into two slides per application territory. I apologize. Um, but th so this is the JavaScript. Um, it's all the Angular stuff. So we've got the function that gets called when somebody places an order. And this, like, they could pass in pie or cake or just all kind of things, right? Um, and the, which then calls the back end API. Um, and then it gets back that order number. And the, the idea, one, one fun thing about this, it'll return almost, oh, are you serious? OK. Ah, <laughs> oh, dang. Um, I did need an hour. Um, OK. Yeah, I'm going to kill a minute just thinking through that. You say five minutes or one minute? One minute? OK. Um, I'm going to skip right through. So it's fun. You can do stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> Look at that. Um, Angular, nobody likes Angular. Um, wow, that's insane. OK, insane. Don't do this. There's, this can be done way better, right? I was tired when I did it. Um, this is that check inventory, gets the whole data set, makes it different. This is fun thing, like you can reload your, this is a fun UWSKI thing, like reload your app server. Yeah, wire that to something sweet. Um, okay, disaster. What I wanted to show you back here. Ah, oh, crap, 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 crap. No, wait, no, it's up here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yes, I left this line out, and things don't work. <laughs> and, and that's the error message you get. <laughs> okay, um, you know that was that was this wasn't on the other slides. I wanted to show you this because it, it it couldn't this can save you. Um, if you see application zero, that's code word for Python. <laughs> um, and there's a reason for that, but you know just so you know, yeah. So don't leave that out. Also, um, fun fact: if you rearrange the order of these things, you get different results. <laughs> I, I, w I had a hard time reproducing this, but I swear I saw it happen. And I think it was with it was with some, some plugin configuration here that, like, the plugin path when in, in a different configuration I was using. I had the plugin path behind after the plugins. So I couldn't find it. I'm supposed to finish now, but there's stuff. Um, oh, wait, wait. Uh, no. Okay, down here. If you go to my website, the, you can find the slides. Typist.geek.nz, and you can look at all this stuff later. And um, also do that. Yeah. The slides will also be on the website for the conference. Oh, do you need the back? Sorry. Yeah.